Tonight, a family's plea for police to do more to find the victims of an alleged serial killer. They say that they can't search because it's not feasible. Is human life not feasible? Police defend a decision to not search a landfill for the remains of two Indigenous women. Inside a hospital bursting with sick kids, now bracing for a wave of sick adults. Usually they come two to three weeks after the kids' cases start to pee. She survived the Ecole Polytechnique massacre and says all these decades later, she's now stalked by hate. It's violent and it's sexually aggressive. Sometimes it even threatened my mother. Your mom? Yeah. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a landfill just outside Winnipeg is the focus of a police investigation and an urgent plea for action from the families of the victims of an alleged serial killer. The landfill is where police believe the remains of Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron are, but they maintain searching that landfill just isn't feasible. So that has families demanding police do more to find those remains and bring them home. Cameron McIntosh now with their anger as police defend their decision. Somewhere in that freezing landfill, police say are irretrievable remains of two murdered Indigenous women, Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron. I should not have to come here and be so mad and beg and beg so that you will find and bring our loved ones home. Whose families, including Morgan Harris's daughter, along with some Indigenous leaders, traveled to Ottawa to insist the bodies be recovered. Police won't do anything, and they say that they can't search because it's not feasible. Is human life not feasible? Last week, police announced charges in the murders of Harris and Myron, along with another woman identified only by this jacket now being referred to by elders as Buffalo Woman. The charges stem from evidence in the investigation into the death of a fourth woman, Rebecca Contois. Last May, Contois' remains were found in this area of freshly dumped garbage in Winnipeg's largest landfill. We didn't have a starting point. Now police say the remains of Harris and Myron went to a different landfill, weeks before their murders were discovered. They were compacted, spread out, buried with animal remains, and capped with clay. It's to a depth of about 40 feet. And you can see it's, you can't really see the garbage. It's underneath that wet, heavy construction clay that's been packed and bulldozed and manipulated by heavy machinery for, for 34 days uh, between the time of disposal and the time of our awareness. It's tough when we're being criticized for almost a lack of, a lack of caring, when I don't think that's the case. Um, our members are, are working extremely hard in this case. Jeremy Skibicki faces four first-degree murder charges, one for each woman. His lawyer says he'll plead not guilty. Meanwhile, the families and leaders who traveled to Ottawa met with the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, citing these killings as yet another example of a failure to protect vulnerable Indigenous women. I'm really hoping that, you know, the federal government will act today, and it should have been yesterday. So there's no normalizing this away. This is happening today, and uh, it is an, is an absolute shame that a person like me has to stand here today and tell people and cannot guarantee people that this will not happen again. Um, but that's the reality. Now, Miller says the government is working on core issues like safe housing, but concedes the federal government isn't moving fast enough. Today, he suggested more funding could be made available for searches in murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in two-spirited people cases. However, today, the Winnipeg police said funding here isn't the issue. It was timing and logistics. And Cameron, I know there's another big unknown here. Just who is that woman still unidentified who people are now calling Buffalo Woman? Yeah, so that name was granted to her yesterday by Anishinaabe elders. They said they didn't want this woman to be just another Jane Doe, that they wanted her to have an identity in the community while police are still trying to determine her identity. Today, we asked the police about that investigation. They say they've had some calls in, but are really no closer to identifying her. Adrian? All right, Cameron McIntosh in Winnipeg. Thanks, Cam. If you're affected by this or other cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, support is available. You can reach someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week at this toll-free number, 1-844-413-6643.
for nine. Canada's Auditor General has delivered her verdict tonight on key elements of the federal government's pandemic response. They were effective, expensive, and wasteful. Karen Hogan acknowledged pandemic benefits did bring rapid relief to Canadians, but many recipients weren't eligible. The report identified more than $4 billion in clear overpayments, another $27 billion plus in payments that need more investigation. For comparison, that is roughly the price tag for the government's five-year national child care program. And as John Paul Tasker shows us, it's not clear the government can recover the money. And it wasn't the only area where the Auditor General found waste. Canada did not have Canada's Auditor General said the federal government's pandemic relief programs may have worked to protect people from joblessness and poverty, but... Billions of dollars have gone or may have gone to ineligible recipients. The questionable COVID payments were sent out through the emergency relief benefit and wage subsidy programs. We found that overpayments of $4.6 billion were made to ineligible individuals. And we estimated that at least $27.4 billion of payments to individuals and employers should be investigated further. She said while the waste was to be expected because the programs were set up so quickly, she's critical of how slow Ottawa has been to claw back the payments. The government says it sent out a million letters asking for proof of eligibility. We're trying to work with Canadians in a very difficult time, and I wouldn't mistake a lack of aggressive pursuit for not doing it, it's just we're being compassionate. Conservative MPs say the flood of COVID payouts is partly to blame for the surging cost of living. This is another example of that inflationary waste that is forcing more and more Canadians into food banks. Along with COVID benefits, the Auditor General found waste in the government's vaccine program. At least 13 million doses expired before they could ever reach an arm. Now it's about minimizing wastage and better inventory management going forward. I think this is very problematic that that much money was wasted, that much vaccine, that many doses of vaccines were wasted. Millions more vaccine doses are expected to expire by year's end, and time is running out for the government to recover those dubious COVID payouts. By law, they only have 36 months to try and get the money back. The Auditor General said today it's likely billions of dollars in payouts will never be recovered. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. COVID, RSV and the flu are all putting extraordinary pressure on hospitals right across this country. Well, tonight we can give you an exclusive look inside one of those hospitals. As Lauren Pelly shows us, staff struggling with a spike of sick kids are now bracing for a surge of adult patients too. Like so many Canadian hospitals, this one north of Toronto is filled with patients battling all kinds of respiratory viruses. <laughs> Four-year-old Wolfgang is one of the youngest. On this day, he's being treated for his third bout of pneumonia since September. And we've spent so much time in hospital with him, but it's hard to see your little guy struggle. Wolfgang has severe asthma, putting him at risk of serious illness any time he catches a respiratory infection. This year, it's been hard to avoid. The ER nurse that came with us in the ambulance ride down telling us how lucky we were to even get a bed here because uh, the crisis is so severe right now. Yeah. Right, yeah. The pediatric team here at Markham Stouffville Hospital told us their unit is overflowing. I've got three extra shifts this week to help deal with the uh, increased numbers. The team's funding is for five beds. Instead, they're caring for a dozen or more children every day. We are ready for a 300% plus capacity here, um, but if we do want to go any higher than that, we do have to start creeping into some of our adult spaces, which we are prepared to do so. But using adult beds for kids could prove tricky. It's actually very difficult. The hospital's infection control exactly. lead projects at least 20% more adult admissions than a typical flu season. Our real concern is the severity of illness that we're seeing in the kids. And we're expecting to see, see more adult cases. Usually they come two to three weeks after the kids' cases start to peak. The hospital is already at its limit. A major surge in adult patients would force the team to add more beds. No easy task after years of staff shortages. Just did a chest x-ray. We're just waiting for his results. 
The hospital's newly opened respiratory virus clinic is one way they're trying to keep sick community members from needing a bed in the first place. This space used to be a COVID-19 assessment center. It's much better than actually... Medical director Dr. Christina Popa um, says it's meant to take pressure off the emergency department. We have individual rooms that the patients can get the actual privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're automatically isolated. They are automatically isolated. There are no easy answers for how Canadian hospitals will get through the next few months. Staff here are just trying to stay afloat while helping patients like Wolfgang get better so they can get back home. So I should note, since we visited the hospital, Wolfgang has actually come back home and he's now recovering with his parents. Okay, so there's some good news. I, I'm imagining Canadians at home looking at this and saying, I, I don't want to end up in hospital and I don't want my little ones to end up in hospital. So, so what are the takeaways here? Well, some of these above average projections for flu admissions are tied to Canada's fairly low vaccination rate. For seniors who are at a high risk of influenza, they actually only have around a 70% vaccination rate in recent years. That's 10% lower than the federal government's targets. So the physicians that we spoke to said, get your flu shot. Everyone in Canada over the age of six months old is eligible. All right, Lauren Pelly, senior health and medical reporter. Thank you. Alberta is hoping to ease some of the pressure on its hospitals after securing its own supply of children's pain and fever medication. I think that just about every parent with young ones at home is frustrated and worried about the shortage of children's over-the-counter medications right now. Premier Danielle Smith says the province has procured 5 million bottles of pediatric acetaminophen and ibuprofen from a Turkish manufacturer, though Health Canada still has to approve the process. Alberta says it will distribute the medication across the province and then share any extra with the rest of the country. The Assembly of First Nations is tapping former Senator Murray Sinclair to help bring the organization together and help address some turmoil within its leadership. As Olivia Stefanovich tells us now, this comes as those leaders met in Ottawa. A show of unity as tensions between the National Chief and the Assembly of First Nations Executive Committee threaten to overshadow their meetings once again. We will avoid unhealthy situations and seek the help of a mediator. National Chief Roseanne Archibald says Murray Sinclair, the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, will be appointed mediator in the new year. We can't spend another minute Never mind a chief's assembly in turmoil. Our people are watching. But a workplace investigation into her conduct continues to cloud progress. What is currently outstanding is an interview with the national chief. What I am told by the investigators is that meaningful steps to move the investigation forward cannot take place until they are able to have that interview with her. The AFN Executive Committee temporarily suspended Archibald earlier this year after four of her senior staff filed bullying and harassment complaints against her. Now CBC News has learned Archibald is facing a fifth complaint from the Assembly's CEO. But to bring Murray Sinclair, I don't see that helping at all. Some chiefs are skeptical the relationship between the National Chief and Executive Committee can be fixed. Perhaps we, the AFN uh, explores a, a new national chief if they, we can't work together because they have to work together. But others are standing by Archibald. I really see the national chief doing that important work. Not She's not just in Ottawa, you know, so I really uh, think we do need that, that connection. Unless the national chief and executive committee can set aside their differences, they'll remain in turmoil, leaving the AFN at a crossroads. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. And we now have some breaking political news. U.S. networks are projecting that voters in Georgia have just sent another Democrat to the U.S. Senate in a runoff vote with a razor-thin margin. Katie Simpson joins us now from Washington. So, Katie, this was, this was expected to be close. 
Well, Democrats jumped out to an early lead, and even though the numbers flipped back and forth, they ended up with enough to send Raphael Warnock back to the Senate. This is a huge relief for the Biden administration, and it was not entirely unexpected. Over the final days of this race, Raphael Warnock has been the candidate projecting front-runner energy, a careful balance of confidence and caution. We should not rest on our laurels. The job is not done. The truth is my opponent could still win this election. Compare the Democrats' final rally with that of his Republican opponent. Herschel Walker shook hands and posed for photos with a far more subdued crowd. What we're hearing from some Republican voters is because control of the Senate isn't on the line. That's dampening some of that enthusiasm. Big names campaigned for Warnock, aiming to make the current president's life easier. While Democrats control the split Senate, an extra seat means Joe Biden doesn't have to rely as much on unpredictable Democrats, including Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, who have helped block some of his agenda. Republicans want to keep it that way. I'm fighting hard for Herschel because I think it's important that we have a Republican in that seat. Because of the grace of God. The party urged voters to look at the big picture and passed some of Walker's controversies, much of it based on his anti-abortion stance, despite allegations from multiple women he encouraged or paid for their abortions. Herschel Walker will probably go down as one of the worst Republican candidates in, in our party's history. This vote also has implications for the race to be the Republican presidential nominee. Come on up here, Herschel Walker. Come Donald Trump endorsed Walker, hoping to prove to critics he's still influential in battleground states. Last month, some of his Republican critics already wrote him off. There's significant influence from the former president, um, and I think that influence uh, probably hurt the party and, and hurt the party's chances on Election Day. So, Katie, I, I, I gather Republicans are already taking away some lessons from this race. Yeah, they'll be looking at the Trump factor. How did that influence voters? It was a problem in the midterms, and this will be another blow to Trump's presidential campaign. But in this particular case, candidate quality is a factor. Walker made statements and claims that were unbackable for many in his party. So even before the votes were counted, there were calls for better vetting and higher candidate standards. All right, Katie Simpson in Washington tonight. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. A jury has convicted two of Donald Trump's companies on 17 charges related to a scheme to dodge taxes. So the case turned on the testimony of the Trump Organization's former financial chief, who admitted to cooking the books to avoid taxes on his compensation. Trump says his lawyers will appeal the conviction, calling it a, quote, Manhattan witch hunt. Prosecutors in Manhattan are separately looking into allegations that Trump lied about the value of his properties. The suspect, accused of opening fire inside an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado, has been charged with murder and hate crimes. We're not going to tolerate actions against community members based on their sexual um, identity. Prosecutors handed down a total of 305 criminal counts against the defendant, Five people were killed in the shooting last month. At least 17 others were injured. World leaders gathering in Montreal are trying to reach an agreement that would protect the world's oceans, plants, and animals. But as Jayla Bernstein tells us, it's off to a rocky start. Thank you. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was interrupted mid-sentence during his opening remarks. The Arctic in the north, vast and filled with unexpected life. Delegates looked on as members of the Tulaamin Nation on the West Coast called out colonialism and the invasion of Indigenous lands. Moments later, the speeches continued with a $350 million announcement from Trudeau and a dire assessment from the UN Secretary General. Humanity seems hell-bent on destruction. We are waging war on nature. The message from the UN, humans are destroying the environment, pushing species to the brink of extinction. The hope is this will be the moment the world agrees on an ambitious plan for the future, one that includes protecting 30% of land and oceans by 2030. Biodiversity underpins our very existence on this planet. 
This massive room is where international delegates will be meeting, spending some long hours to negotiate a global pact to stop and reverse biodiversity loss. It's no easy task. Some progress has been made, but not so much as needed or expected. There's just two weeks to finalize the deal and a lot of work left. Countries failed to meet the last set of global biodiversity targets by 2020. The lessons learned? The agreement needs specific goals with plans for progress reports and with money to back it all up. We were really concerned that financing could be the issue that unrails these negotiations at the end. A lot rides on this summit and whether nations agree to stop the erosion of life on land and in oceans before it's too late. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. 33 years after a gunman killed 14 women at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal, one survivor says she's the target of online abuse. It's violent and it's sexually aggressive. Sometimes it even threatened my mother. Your mom? Yeah. Natalie Prevost talks about her tireless advocacy and the online hate she faces because of it. Plus a controversial new law in Indonesia. You'll see a whole bunch of people who choose not to go there. The country's harsh new penalties for sex outside of marriage and a musical legend gives a rare performance. A surprise sing-along that brought a Broadway audience to its feet. We're back in two. Okay, well, that's awful. A frightening situation for that five-year-old in Connecticut. So you can sort of see her there trying to shake off a raccoon and then her mom in the orange coming to rescue, to yank the animal off her before eventually, there it is, throwing the animal across the lawn. Now, thankfully, both mom and daughter only sustained some minor scratches and bites. The two have started a few rounds of rabies shots, just in case. And in Indonesia, having sex outside of marriage will soon be illegal. And that includes tourists. So as Sasha Petrosik tells us, that's not the only new law being brought in. After little debate in Indonesia's parliament, it moved to outlaw any sex outside of marriage, with a penalty of up to a year in jail. It isn't easy to accommodate everyone, says the minister in charge, but we had to make a decision. The new laws won't come into effect for three years. With the largest Muslim population in any one country, the move has strong support from conservative Islamic leaders, increasingly influential ones. The laws also target blasphemy and make it a crime to insult the president or hold unauthorized demonstrations. Loud opposing voices quickly gathered, saying the country is tarnishing its image as one of the more democratic in the region. It's a setback for Indonesia, says this activist. It could make us all criminals, says this man. Young people are especially at risk. So are LGBTQ couples since same-sex marriage isn't an option in Indonesia. And foreigners who visit Bali's popular beaches can also be charged, a decision that may hurt Indonesia's tourism industry. You'll see a whole bunch of people who choose not to go there. In practice, tourists may be less vulnerable since any complaint for sexual offenses has to come from a close relative. Still... Because the economics of it you're going to give up a lot of money for, you know, a principle. The last time Indonesia tried to ban sex for the unmarried, huge demonstrations forced the government to backtrack. It could happen again if the country doesn't give consent. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Today marks 33 years since a gunman shot and killed 14 women at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. And after the break, we'll hear from a survivor of that day. What can I say to that? We had to survive. We had to cope with it. I had to repair my wounds, to, to, to learn to walk again. 
her outspoken advocacy and the attacks she now faces online. Next. Those 14 beams are lighting up a rainy, foggy Montreal sky tonight in memory of 14 young women whose dreams went dark. Their lives snuffed out when a gunman opened fire more than three decades ago. The Prime Minister and the Quebec Premier took part in a vigil at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal where those women had been studying for a future of accomplishment. Flowers were laid at their memorial in a ceremony that each year remained so very powerful. So for 33 years, exactly, the name Ecole Polytechnique has broken hearts. It can instantly conjure the shock and grief of that mass shooting that killed 14 young women and injured 14 others. Students targeted in their engineering class because they were women. That December 6th night in Montreal still scars all these years later. Given there's still a heaviness to that name, Polytechnique, consider this. An ad from Canada's largest firearms rights lobby for sale of clothing and other items with the promo code POLY. Imagine how that sits with the likes of Natalie Provost, A Polytechnique survivor, so profoundly wounded she had to learn how to walk again. She spent decades advocating for stronger gun control. So we met in Montreal to talk about that work and the belittling and online abuse and threats that now go with it. Get the out of here with your gun ban recommendations, you useless. That's, that's one. That's one. If you think this gun ban would have stopped this shooter, I feel sorry for you. You're garbage. Just a sample and far from the worst of what's directed her way. It's violent and it's sexually aggressive. Sometimes it even threatens my mother. Your mom? Yeah. Why? Why do they have to threat something to my mother? It's so cheap. It's so small. It's not the view I want to have on my society, on the people with whom I live. So my strategy even, I don't know if it's a good one or not, it's to stay naive. It's to stay a bit far away from it. I'm really lucky. I have colleagues who help me just don't they go shield you from it. Yeah, yeah, because I don't think I can handle it. Is it any wonder her friends and family want to protect her? That December night in her engineering class, when gunman Mark Lapine burst in, he separated the men and women and killed the women. Natalie Prevost was severely injured, shot multiple times. Still, she tried to convince him to stop shooting, encouraged her friends to play dead to save their lives. Even emerging from hospital, she was bold enough to talk, to try to protect and inspire. I ask every girl in Quebec and everywhere in the world who wants to be an engineer to keep this idea in, in their mind because engineering is a great profession. She spread that message for decades as well as one for more comprehensive gun control. We built something for the safety of all Canadians. So the memory of, our, of my classmates are not lost, and I'm very proud of that. Consistently, she tries to hold governments to account. Frustrated, she quit the Firearms Committee in 2019 because for all the encouraging words, action she thought was missing. What does the finish line look like? We will have a mandatory buyback. We will have something regarding uh, magazines. We finally have a proposition regarding a definition of assault-style weapon that will be integrated. It's not perfect. We're not as strong as uh, New Zealand, but we are going there. We want to have a better security for all Canadians. That's my goal and that's what I want. A recent post buying into a trope of online trolls that Natalie Prevost may not be the victim the world knows her to be. Mass shooting survivor has become a title that's pretty hard to believe, the post reads, and goes on to suggest she could not possibly have been shot with the weapon she suggests. You went through so much and I they are lies flung like dirt, including that she's paid for her activism, which she emphatically denies. We have been accused, and 
even one of the uh, the candidates for prime minister in Quebec to, to be liars and to be using what happened to us to, for our own credit. And um, what can I say to that? We had to survive. We had to cope with it. I had to repair my wounds, to, to, to learn to walk again. I cannot understand. There, there's, there's some place where I don't have any... Um, capacity to fight back. It must be hard wearing the mantle of being strong and inspirational. Expectations pile on. You symbolize the interrupted dreams of my classmates. Every year after the shooting, she's been there, standing alongside female engineering students, pushing politicians, sometimes encouraged to run for office. I really, really contemplate the possibility to do that because contribution for my society is at the heart of my life. I really think I could have done a, a good job as a representative. But no, the threats are not. so aggressive and, and the criticism so aggressive, you're saying, I the forget it. The impact of all social media on representative is so important that I don't think that my mental health will resist it. Saving some of her strength for her own health, maybe never imagining she'd find herself a type of target again. But if some want Natalie Prevost to stay quiet, they can forget it. Those 14 women are still with us, alive in a way. After all she's endured, she says she will not be bullied into silence. Now we reached out to the firearms rights group that had used that promo code POLY. The code isn't active anymore. They maintain it wasn't about the massacre at Ecole Polytechnique, but a response to the Twitter account, Polly Susuvien, or Polly Remembers, which is largely a gun control group that Natalie Prevost and others connected to that terrible day belong to. You can hear more from Natalie Prevost on As It Happens with host Chris Howden and Neil Coxell. You can listen on demand anytime on the CBC Listen app. Now, hospitals across Canada are being hit by a perfect storm of respiratory illness. Coming up, why this season is so much worse. Our panel of doctors will be here next. I'm really, really excited for that, and I can't wait to hopefully be able to play in that one day. The news only broke yesterday right here on The National, but Canada's new professional women's soccer league is already a source of inspiration. Well, tonight, a closer look at the triple threat of viruses, influenza, RSV, and COVID and why so many are becoming seriously ill. Health officials warn the flu is landing both young children and seniors in hospital at higher rates. And the influx is, of course, having an effect on a healthcare system that's already struggling. So why is this early and intense flu season hitting hospitals so hard? Will it get worse before it gets better? Dr. Fatima Kakar is a pediatric infectious diseases specialist in Montreal. Dr. Isaac Bogosh joins us from Toronto. You know them both. Doctors, when we, when we hear descriptions of hospitals under strain, can you put this in some perspective for us, Dr. Kakar? Yes, and to be honest, I've never seen our pediatric hospital so full and so full of children with severe infections, complications from the flu. Every bed is occupied, every bed is precious, and the lineups in Emerge waiting to get in are huge. So the system is under strain, but I've never seen such significant infections and such severity of infections uh, since I've been a physician. Dr. Bogosh, does that echo what you're seeing too? Not entirely. I mean, certainly the adult healthcare system is stretched, and we, it has been for some time. And the degree of how much it's been stretched has sort of ebbed and flowed throughout the pandemic and, of course, into the influenza season. I think there's certainly tough times ahead, and it's certainly challenging right now. But compared to how significant the issues are in the pediatric world, I would say that the adult healthcare system, while stretched, is not stretched as far as they are in the peds. 
Okay, so the, the, the focus on kids right now, and, and I suppose, Dr. Kakar, the question then is, is how does this compare with what happened to kids during COVID? I mean, in terms of what you're seeing, what sort of symptoms and effects? There's actually no comparison. So influenza right now is much more severe than anything we've seen from COVID, any complications from COVID, just in, in, in terms of sheer hospitalization numbers and in severity, and actually even more severe than what we've seen with RSV. The difference with influenza is what happens after you get it. The week or two after, you can get severe complicated infections requiring ICU support, needing surgery, long-term hospitalizations, which is very different from what we saw with COVID and even what we were seeing with RSV previously. So please forgive my ignorance here, but, but what's going on here? Why, why is it that we're seeing these huge numbers in these intensely severe cases? Dr. Bogosh, to you. Yeah, I don't think we can speak confidently on this. Certainly, there's a lot of different theories floating around. One of them is that over the last couple of years, we haven't really been exposed to the, the viruses that we're normally exposed to the, to the same degree. So at a population level, we have less population level immunity. That's not to say we want people to get infected. We obviously don't. But suddenly you're getting two years worth of infections in a short period of time. That's one theory. Another theory is that COVID can dysregulate our immune systems, and perhaps that might be uh, causing some more of the severe infections that we're seeing right now. I think it's obviously premature to be confident on any of these, but those are a couple of the theories that are floating around. Interesting. You know, earlier in the show, I was thinking about the item we had in the first block about, about a hospital in Markham currently struggling with kids, but anticipating a surge in adult hospitalizations. Does this match the modeling you're both seeing, Dr. Bogosh, first? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, we already are starting to see an uptick in the number of people hospitalized with influenza. It's particularly uh, predominant in the, in the age group over 65. But of course, anyone of any age can get this infection. In the adult world, though, old, typically older individuals and individuals with underlying medical conditions are more at risk of severe infection that bring them into hospital. We've already started to see it. Unfortunately, it's still early in, in the influenza season. So we'll be seeing a lot more of this as we move forward. I think the key point to parlay is that the vaccine is safe. It's widely available. Anyone over the age of six months can get the, the uh, influenza vaccine. It goes a long way in protecting people from getting the flu. And if you do get the flu, it still goes a long way in keeping people out of hospital. Okay, so to that point, I mean, you, you've both strongly made that point, but also made the connection that, that certainly the vaccination rates amongst kids for the flu, I mean, it's, it, it's not great. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a large uptake amongst adults. Why not? And, and how, do you, how do you deal with that, Dr. Kakar? And I know there's been a lot of vaccine fatigue with COVID, and that's part of it. But another part is that it's just been difficult for people to get those vaccine shots. In Quebec, it wasn't free for all children until just a few weeks ago. And just making the appointments for people who want to get the vaccine is almost impossible. Almost every single person on call with me this past week is in a rush to get their children vaccinated and the appointments are not easily available, they're not readily available, and that's been an issue. Dr. Bogosh. We've got to lower barriers to vaccination, just like we did with the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine for doses one and two. You need sound communication that's targeted. You need strong community outreach and community engagements, especially with communities that are disproportionately impacted by the flu. And then you need to lower barriers by bringing the vaccine to the people, putting pop-up vaccine clinics into temples, into community centers, into uh, schools, into where people are. And masks, right? I didn't, I didn't hear you say masks, but I have a feeling that, that you're seeing masks is just a given. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, we're in respiratory virus season. If you want to prevent the transmission of respiratory viruses, if you want to lower your individual risk of getting a respiratory virus, Absolutely. Masking in indoor spaces where we know the, the vast majority of these viruses are transmitted is a given. And again, there's very few mandates across the country, but people can make the smart decision and put on a mask in an indoor space. It will reduce your risk of getting one of these infections. Last brief thought to you, Dr. Kukar. Absolutely. And I think especially in high risk settings, I look at pharmacies where people are gathered looking for medications and not a single mask to be seen. Hospitals, public transport, these viruses are circulating. And if you're getting very sick right now with a high fever, it's likely influenza. So please wear a mask, stay home, try to protect others around you because there's just so much of this circulating right now.
Thank you both so much, Dr. Fatima Kakar, pediatric infectious disease specialist in Montreal, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, infectious disease specialist in Toronto. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. We broke the news to you last night right here in the National, and for women across the country, it is about time. The fact that it took so long is also a bit crazy. Coming up, Canada's new women's soccer league and the big dreams already riding on it. Plus. So good indeed. Neil Diamond brings down the house with a moving performance in our mind. Well, the votes have been counted. The results are in. The municipality of Chatham, Kent, Ontario has revealed the winning cheeky names for its snowplows this season. Among the winners, Betty Whiteout, my favorite, Control Salt Delete, Edward Blizzard Hands, and Fleury Jenkins, named after hometown Major League Baseball legend Fergie Jenkins. And a historic win for Morocco at the Men's World Cup. The team became the first ever Arab country to make it to the tournament's quarterfinals. They beat Spain in penalty kicks after a no-goal game. Morocco's goalkeeper, who just so happens to have been born in Montreal, was a big part of that win. Yassine Bounou blocked two kicks. An update now on a story we broke here on The National last night. The creation of a women's professional soccer league in Canada. Renee Filipponi now with reaction to the big announcement. For these young elite players, the prospect of getting paid to play here in Canada is exciting and much anticipated. The fact that it took so long is also a bit crazy, but we're also so thankful that we're seeing progressions in the women's sport. The Vancouver Whitecaps will be home to one of eight teams in a new professional women's league, which plans to launch in 2025. And I've always grown up with this idea of I have to go play in America before I come home. Um, so I think for them it's, it's, it's reality that they could be playing in front of local fans. Christine Sinclair, it's two. Soccer superstar Christine Sinclair has been pushing for this for years and broke the news on the national alongside her former teammate Diana Matheson that they plan to start the league. We were at one point those, those little kids looking up to male athletes. Um, and it's time to, to change the narrative. Matheson says she has secured owners for clubs in Vancouver and Calgary, but needs six more major backers. Women's sport, women's professional sport is a new industry. Uh, it's growing faster than men's sport, and it will keep growing over the next two decades. During the Tokyo Olympics, more than four million watched Canada's women win gold, the most viewed event of the games in this country. And while the World Cup has shown what a draw men's soccer can be, there is untapped potential for women's sport, says this expert. But I think if you look broadly throughout North America at the traditional uh, commercial sport business model, we are a bit saturated on the men's side. It's time for a women's professional league in Canada. Organizers expect to draw nearly 4,000 fans to attend each match. Fans who could be cheering on players like Claire Logan. I'm really, really excited for that, and I can't wait to hopefully be able to play in that one day. A new opportunity on home turf. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Oh, it's just a tease. I know you want to sing along at home if you feel like it. Sweet Caroline, of course. Neil Diamond, this is infectious. And the surprise performance came Sunday night at the Broadway premiere of his brand new musical, A Beautiful Mix. So Diamond retired in 2018 after being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. That did not stop him from thrilling fans with one of the classics. And tonight, it's our moment. We were at A Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond musical opening up at Broadhurst Theatre in New York City. And at the end of the curtain call, Mr. Diamond sort of got up, you know, he waved and we thought that would be it. But then somebody handed him a mic and he started singing. Honestly, it, it sort of became a little bit emotional because we were all looking at a, like a, a legend right in front of our eyes singing. We did know of his Parkinson's disease. Going into the theater while he was walking the red carpet, he did need a little bit of help walking, 
And so it was even more special when he got up on his own and just started singing. It was honestly just breathtaking. It's an earworm. I, I, I still have it. So you know the story. He, he wrote this in uh, 1969. Uh, if you don't know, he wrote it for his second wife, but her name was Marcia, and it didn't really work. So he, you know, he liked the name Caroline, and there you go. That is a national for December the 6th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.